Amen and amen. Thank you, Pastor Kenny, for your hospitality this morning. Dumelang, Liam Ochetwe, Momochai, Siana Magella, Rooted Fellowship. Welcome by Hans Kak and welcome to church. Uh, as Pastor Kenny alluded, my name is Jono, and I get the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here under the leadership of our lead pastor, Pastor Oni Mokhatle, alongside Pastor Kenny and Pastor Stephen. And I get the privilege of opening God's word up today to see what he has to say for us at Rooted Fellowship. We're in the middle of a, a sermon series titled Eating with Jesus. And that's because we believe, or rather, we know that the table matters. The table matters. And we see this particularly in the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the perfect king who over the course of his earthly ministry dined at various tables. We said this last week. Last week, we also savored our appetizers or our starters as the gospel of Luke reminded us that Jesus calls the ani, the poor, indeed all of those in desperate need of a savior to join him at his table, the table of grace and mercy. Because remember fam, at our Lord's table, we find an open invitation. We find our true identities as children of God. We find complete transformation, restoration. We find healing, spiritual, physical, emotional, psychological, and we find fellowship and communion, amen? We find joy and abundant life. And last week, as we sampled our starters, we saw that that is exactly what the tax collector Levi and his circle of sinner friends found at Jesus' table. We read that, Luke 5, verse 27 to 39. Now, you may recall that last week I mentioned that there was an author by the name of Robert Karras wrote a book titled, Eating Your Way Through Luke's Gospel. And in the book, uh, Robert Karras makes the case that Jesus is either enjoying a meal in the Gospel of Luke, he's coming from a meal, or he's heading to a meal. And so after the meal that we read about, in Luke chapter five, verses 27 to 39, Jesus then leaves that meal and he continues with his earthly ministry of preaching the good news to the poor, or the Hebrew word, the ani. He continues to go about healing, teaching many, preaching to many, and he sets free the oppressed. And he does this all as he moves through the region of Galilee for the next couple of chapters in the Gospel of Luke. And in these chapters, we see Jesus call and gather more and more followers. He teaches to a few, he preaches to many. He heals people physically, and as he does so, he heals them spiritually as well. He raises people from the dead, again, both physically and spiritually. And all of this is much to the disdain of the strict religious teachers known as the Pharisees and scribes. Remember these guys from last week, fam? You recall that they were the strict traditional law followers. And they were obsessed with the legalistic following of the Jewish law above all else. They believed in a salvation by goods, religious works. Remember, they believed that you were only good with God based on what you did and what you didn't do. Where you went, where you didn't go. Based on who you associated with and who you distanced yourself from. Very importantly, who you distanced yourself from. You needed to do the right things at the right times. And because of all of this, they openly challenged and they expressly opposed Jesus. And they just couldn't. In fact, they would not recognize Jesus as the long-awaited promised son of God who came to usher in the kingdom of God on earth. And so all of that has been taking place. Just as Robert Karras notes, we then once again read about Jesus making his way to the dinner table in Luke chapter seven, verses 36 to 50, which is our text for today. So Luke seven, verse 36, you can meet us there in your Bibles or on your devices. Alternatively, it'll be up on the screen and I'm gonna be reading from the Christian Standard Bible today. That's Luke chapter seven, verse 36 to 50. Let's hear God's word. Then one of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And a woman in the town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume 
and stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with her hair, kissing them and anointing them with the perfume. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner. Jesus replied to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, say it, teacher. A creditor had two debtors. One owned one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Which of them will love him more? Simon answered, ah, I suppose, I suppose the one he forgave more. You have judged correctly, he told him. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she with her tears has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little, loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this man who even forgives sin? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Family, this is the word of the Lord, and so thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh, loving, good, gracious God, we come to you this morning, adoring you, worshiping you, praising you, Lord God, for your mercy, for your grace. We thank you for your word that we can read this morning. We thank you, Lord God, for the living word, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so, Holy Spirit, would you come now? Would you lead me in delivering this, your word? Would you lead us in this time? Would this time, as we delve into this text today, serve as an entree or the mains of our series, Lord God? Would this be a satisfying, nourishing, sustaining, life-changing meal, Lord God? And would you lead us, Lord God, to respond with joy and satisfaction after eating, like we would after eating a good meal, Lord God? May we respond in worship and in truth. Come, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Family, before we get into our text for today, I have something to say. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, family and friends, curious skeptic or intrigued unbeliever, D.T. Niles, the Sri Lankan evangelist and church leader, said that Christianity is merely one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. And so if you'll indulge me for a moment and allow me to apply this to our current series, Eating with Jesus, before we really tuck into our text for today, I'd ask you that you just permit me the time to let you know where I have found this bread. And as we prepare to dine and eat with Jesus, as if we were dining with him at a fine restaurant, would you graciously allow me the time to get into our specials for this morning? The things that I'd love to highlight for you before you respond and make an informed decision at our Lord's table today. The specials. Paul says in Romans 3 verses 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But, verse 24, they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And Romans 6 verse 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this Jesus Christ is the only son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father, through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, he became the incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. Amen and amen. 
And so that is how we come this morning, family. All of us beggars and sinners in need of the bread of life, in need of the mercy of God. But God, oh, but God in his grace gives us this King Jesus who meets us exactly where we are, forgives us, redeems us, restores us, and invites us in. And he sets a heavenly banquet before us and says, come and eat. Come and table with me. And so with that, we come to our verse 36 of Luke chapter 7. Then one of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. He entered the house, the Pharisee's house, and reclined at the table. Now, first glance, and even as we read these words a bit earlier, we could have been thinking, perhaps this Pharisee is different to the other Pharisees, right? Perhaps he genuinely wants to eat with Jesus and maybe pick his brain about some things. In fact, scholars say that the Greek word that Luke uses for invited implies that this Pharisee has been persistent in his invitation of Jesus. He's been inviting him for a while. But as I've mentioned, Jesus has been up to some important things, okay? But eventually he gets a gap and he takes this Pharisee up on his offer. Jesus is in the business of changing hearts. And so he's open to this Pharisee changing his. And so Jesus attends goes to the Pharisee's house as the honored guest, right? The honored guest. So in other words, Jesus is the reason that these folks are having this gathering. They are the reason that they are enjoying this time together. He's the honored guest. But then Luke intentionally notes something. He says immediately after arriving, Jesus subsequently goes and reclines at the table. Immediately. Arrives, goes straight to the table. Now I did some research, and reclining at the table meant that Jesus went and lay down Just had a back off, so I'm not going to do that. But he went and laid down at the table with his hands towards the table and his feet towards the side or the back of the room. That's how you'd recline in Jesus' day at the table. Fondue style. (laughs) Remember, folks, in Jesus' day, there was no Nike, Reebok, Salomon, or Adidas trail shoes in Christ's day. There were no canvas shoes. There were no, what are those other ones that you guys love so much? Crocs. There were no Crocs. So let's be honest, Jesus would have been rocking open-toed sandals, right? His feet would have been dirty and sweaty from walking the dusty roads of the region of Galilee. And Rooted Fellowship, hear me this morning, even though Jesus is fully God, family, he is also fully man. And so his feet would have been, to put it lightly, in need of a wash. And in actual fact, because this was the norm of the day, because your guests would come in with dirty feet, It was customary for the guests to be met by the host's helper with a basin and a towel. And guests would then have their feet washed and dried before entering the dinner party. Luke, however, notes that this, along with a few other hospitable practices, which I'll get to shortly, well, they just didn't take place that day. And so Jesus enters this party supposedly hosted in his honor with dirty and dusty feet. And he goes and sits down, remember, reclining, meant head at the table, hands here, feet towards the side of the room. First half, verse 37, we can pull that up. And a woman in the town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. Now, whilst Luke doesn't mention her name, he does speak of her identity. This woman from the town was a sinner, which implied that her profession was synonymous with being a sinner. Much like we saw with the tax collector, collaborator Levi last week, right? Now, Luke never explicitly mentions that this woman was a prostitute. It's possible that she was. But what's important for us to note is that this woman's, because of whatever she does, whatever profession she does, is synonymous with a sinner. And so she would have been considered poor and ani an outcast, someone that the religious leaders, the Pharisees, would have said should be kept at a distance. And so she was an ani, exactly the type of person that Jesus came to preach the good news to, exactly the type of person that Jesus came to set free. Some commentators speculate that she she most likely would have been in the crowd that day that Jesus preached what Matthew called the Sermon on the Mount and what Luke called the Sermon on the Plain. 
And so she would have heard Jesus preach these words found in Luke 6, verse 20 to 22. Blessed are you who are ani. Blessed are you who are poor. Because the kingdom of God is yours. Blessed are you who are hungry now because you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now because you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, insult you, and slander your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Jesus was preaching this good news to her as she found herself in amongst the crowd that day. And now she finds out that this Jesus is the honored guest at this Pharisee's party. And so she takes her opportunity to meet with him. Now you may be thinking, mm, how will she be able to get in to the party, right? Well, social custom did permit the needy and the poor to attend the banquet towards the end of the night to receive some leftovers. But family, she is not there for leftovers. She comes specifically to dine, to table, and to meet with her King Jesus. And so second part of verse 37, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. Alabaster, heavy, big. Theologians speculate that this jar of perfume would have been about a year's worth of wages, 300 denarii. So we're not talking about Axe, Old Spice, Dove, or Nivea here, right? We're not even talking about Yves Saint Laurent's Black Opium or uh, what's the other one? Emporio Armani Diamonds Intense. Guys, it's Valentine's Day on Tuesday. That one's for free. Apparently, it's Beyonce's favorite. Family, do not miss it. This woman brought a large amount of precious fragrance in an extremely precious, precious jar. And then this woman notices something about the guest in whose honor this dinner has been organized. What does she notice? I'm glad you asked. As I mentioned earlier, there were a number of things that you did for the honored guest as a host at this time. It was customary for a host's helper to meet these honored guests at the door with a basin and a towel and to wash their feet. It was also good hospitality and common practice to greet your guests with a kiss. And it was also common practice to anoint your honored guest's head with a fairly inexpensive, fragrant type of olive oil. Certainly one cheaper than a year's worth of wages. And this would then serve to alert your guests to the fact that y'all are having dinner because of this fragrant-smelling person. Nowadays, we wear buttons and say, bride-to-be, 38 today, I'm the birthday guy. Back in those days, fragrant olive oil. But family, as we've already seen from our text today, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. And so perhaps this Pharisee had another reason to invite Jesus to dinner. And yet here we have this woman noticing this lack of hospitality towards the end of the night and seeking to make things right. She goes, verse 38, and stood behind him, side of the room, at his feet, weeping. Scholars say that the word that Luke uses here for weeping is the same word that James quotes in James 5.18 when he speaks about rain pouring down from the sky, similar to what we've experienced this past week. And so family, this woman isn't merely shedding a tear. She's crying so many tears that she began to wash his feet. Family, she was physically able to produce enough water with her tears that she wiped his feet, then wipes his feet with her hair, not a towel. She breaks custom, reveals her hair, and breaks custom, and dries his feet with her hair. And then what does she do? She doesn't kiss him on the cheek, she kisses his feet, anointing them with her perfume. The same perfume from the precious jar that other accounts speak of her breaking open. So she didn't hold anything back. She didn't say, oh, just some, keep that for later. It amounted to a whole year's worth of wages. Family and friends, 
if that's not utter adoration, devotion, and worship in response to Jesus, then I don't know what is. Verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, he said to himself, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner. And there we have it. The real reason for the dinner invitation is revealed. You see, fam, this Pharisee was most likely intrigued by everything that Jesus was saying and doing, but he didn't actually believe any of it. And let's be honest, maybe this may be you this morning. You may be intrigued by church and Christianity and Jesus, but do we believe it? We sometimes put God to the test and we say, Lord, if you do these things on my terms, then I'll believe. Yeah. And then this Pharisee, he didn't invite Jesus to the table to speak with him or to spend time with him. Rather, he's trying to catch Jesus out. Hence, his inhospitable behavior. And so he sees Jesus receiving hospitality, adoration, and devotion from this woman, and he thinks to himself, this man claims to be God. And yet, even a messenger from God, even a prophet, would know that the, what kind of woman this is, who is touching him. And a godly prophet surely would not get this close to this kind of woman. And so we've got him. I knew he was a fraud. I knew he was a fraud. But Jesus, who is the all-knowing Son of God, he hears this Pharisee's thought, right? He hears this Pharisee who thought to himself, and we know he hears this because Luke says, verse 40, Jesus replied to him. Jesus replied to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, say it, teacher. We now hear this Pharisee's name, Simon. Not Simon Peter, Jesus' disciple, Simon the Pharisee. And then Jesus begins to share a parable in response to Simon's thought. Verse 41, Jesus said, a creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, okay? So that's about two years worth of wages. And the other 50, about two months worth of wages. So two men, one owing two years worth of wages, one owing two months worth of wages. Verse 42, since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered uneasily or reluctantly, I suppose. So he's a true religious academic, right? Doesn't want to be wrong at any point. And so it seems as if he knows where Jesus is going. So he says, well, I suppose the one he forgave more. You have judged correctly, he told him. Then verse 44, turning to the woman, he said, Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she with her tears has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Jesus contrasts this woman's act of sheer devotion with Simon's poor hospitality. Oh, how Simon the Pharisee, who is obsessed with the outward, experience, with the outward appearance, must have hated being contrasted with this woman. Jesus continues, verse 47, therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven that's why she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. Now remember, family, importantly, we saw this earlier today in Paul's letter to the Romans, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that the wages of sin are death. And so, in the eyes of our righteous, almighty, just, and holy God, this woman's sin is no greater than Simon's, and Simon's is no greater or less than this woman's. 
In fact, Jesus only refers to her many sins to prove to Simon that not only does he know exactly who this woman touching him was, but also to prove that he's the all-knowing son of God who knew each and every sin that this woman and all of us have ever committed. And then Jesus does something amazing. He declares or pronounces that this woman's sins have been forgiven. She knows just how much she has sinned. And she knows the debt she cannot pay. And that's why she is there in that way, responding in that manner with so much love, just like the man in the parable a few verses back. And so family, what is Jesus saying? He's saying this. If a man considers his sin to be small, he will be less grateful for forgiveness. If a man considers his sin to be small, he will be less grateful. Our response to God in love doesn't depend on how sinful we actually are, but rather on how sinful we think we are. Our response in God, to God in love doesn't depend on how sinful we actually are, but on how, rather how sinful we think we are. We see this with Simon the Pharisee. Now remember, the Pharisees did not consider themselves to be sinful, and therefore God's grace, mercy, and forgiveness means very little or nothing to them. And so they had no reason to be grateful to God or to respond in love and worship to Him or to others, because they viewed their own abilities as responsible for keeping them right with God. But 1 John 4 verse 10 in the NLT says this, 1 John 4 verse 10 says this, this is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. And so family, it doesn't matter whether our sins are great or small by our earthly standards. We cannot pay back our debt to God by our own righteousness. Now you'll notice something else. Jesus doesn't state it the other way around, verse 37. He doesn't say, she loved much, therefore her sins have been forgiven. He says, her many sins have been forgiven, that's why she loved much. Jesus' salvation is not like the Pharisees' salvation by works. No, instead, her love, her adoration, her worship, and her devotion are the fruit of her sins being forgiven by Jesus. Only by God's grace can we be saved. And so come, Holy Spirit, right now, Lord, whilst we will never know in full, oh God, lead us right now to know much of how truly great our debt truly is. And then Jesus does something absolutely and incredibly beautiful. The next two verses, verse 48 and 49. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Those who were at the table began to say among themselves, who is this man who even forgives sin? Not only is Jesus using this time to announce that he is Jesus' Messiah, God's son who has come to forgive sins, but now he completely transforms her identity in front of everyone at the party, at the table. Previously, when he was speaking about her forgiveness, he was speaking before Simon the Pharisee and was speaking in front of her. But now he is speaking this over her life in front of everyone. She is no longer confined to being a sinner, but Jesus declares in front of everyone that in Almighty God's sight, her sins have been forgiven. Before Jesus, sinner. After Jesus, forgiven. Before Jesus, poor. After Jesus, an heir to the kingdom of God. Before the table, hungry. After the table, satisfied. Oh, at the party, weeping. After that night, laughing and dancing and joyful down the streets of Galilee. And once excluded, now and forever worthy and accepted. Forever, fam, forever. The word that Luke uses for forgiven includes the forgiveness of even her future sins. Yeah. Oh, how merciful, good, gracious, and kind is our loving Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And finally, Roots of Fellowship. Just in case anyone has missed the gospel of grace that took place at this table, Jesus once again, in front of everyone, verse 50, and he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Amen. It was not this woman's love for Jesus that saved her. It was only her faith. Yeah. 
Faith that Jesus was her savior, the only one who could forgive her sins and secure her restoration and salvation for eternity. And so once again, Rooted Fellowship, what is our response? What is our response? Our mealtime is coming to an end. The plates are being cleared. And the bill is on its way. And it's my prayer that if you're in here today and you're a non-Christian and you're sitting here thinking, or perhaps maybe you're listening to this message, what do I do with this message? I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal to all of these friends that there is more grace in Jesus than there is in sin in any of us. There is more grace in Jesus than there is sin in any of us. And I pray that you'd see that this Jesus is waiting to eat with you. He knows what you've done, and yet he is willing to forgive, to restore, and to release you from your burdens, just as he did with the woman in our text today. And then, fellow Christian and brothers, brothers and sisters, what is our response to the gospel today? As we have sat and dined with Jesus today, and as I call the band up, and we prepare to conclude this spiritual meal this morning, I'd ask us, Root of Fellowship, fellow Christian and brother and sister, how's our worship? How's our devotional life? Have we grown cold and forgot about the debt that has been paid? Have we forgot about the miry pits that Jesus reached down and rescued us from? Have we forgot about where we were before we met Jesus? Have we slipped back into thinking that we can earn our salvation by doing the right churchy things, saying the right things at the right time? Corrie ten Boom, the, the famous Christian author, wrote, it is not my ability, but my response to God's ability that counts. It's not my ability, but my response to God's ability that counts. And so are we known as a people of love? as a people of devotion, who respond in worship, in truth, and in love to God for who he is and all that he's done. All that he's done. If you know the word, sing it with me. What he's done, what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. And so rooted are our lives marked by worship and praise. I wonder, I wonder if FNB, Standard Bank, Absa, Nedbank, or Capitec, I wonder if they called you right now and said, uh, by the way, your mortgage, your personal loan, your car loan, it's canceled, it's been settled. What would our response be? I wonder what our response would be. I think that there would be so much hallelujah and amening and running up and down these aisles that we wouldn't know what to do. <sighs> and yet, how do we come to church? How do we come here and respond to him times of praise and worship? Do we come expecting the band and the host and the preacher to make it happen? Mm, I didn't like that today. Didn't like that song. Do we hold back thinking, you know what? One day, one day when I feel comfortable, then I'll lift my, my hands. I'll praise. I'll lift my voices. I'll kneel at the prayer corner. Maybe next week. Family, this woman in our text today gave it all even her entire life savings. She did what she did and gave up her entire life savings. Do we come surrendering our all, intentionally coming to sit and kneel at our Savior's feet? Family, the bull's arrived. I've got to go. But I'm here to tell you that the check's been taken care of. We have dined with Jesus and he's settled up. And so what is your response? Will you come to the front after the gathering? Pray with a leader, an older couple, family group leader, a deacon. Would you come up, non-believer, and surrender your entire life to this Jesus? Or perhaps this morning, Christian brother and sister, we need to come to the prayer corner and just weep at Jesus' feet for what he's done, for the debt that he paid for us. 
or you perhaps kneel at your Savior's feet in devotion, adoration, thanksgiving, and praise as you reflect on all that he's done. Or perhaps you'll be moved to write someone's name and drop it in the baptismal bath. Someone that you're praying would come to know this Jesus. The band's gonna keep playing. There'll be a couple of songs. We're gonna play one song that we're gonna sing. And then there'll be a time and a space for us to respond during that time whilst we're singing in these various ways. Write someone's name, drop it in the, prayer, in the baptismal bath. Come, surrender that area of your life to Jesus by writing it on a card. Let's be intentional, just as this woman in the text was today. She was intentional about meeting with Jesus. And so I ask you to stand as we respond in prayer. <sighs> Holy, good, gracious God, we come before you. Thank you, Lord God, that you are the living bread, Jesus Christ. You fill us and you satisfy us. You invite us to the heavenly banquet in your grace and your mercy because of what you did on that cross at Calvary, Lord God. Lord God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that right now you would just come, Lord God. Come, Holy Spirit. Move in amongst our thoughts and our, amongst us as a people, Lord God. May we respond, Lord God. We will never know what you accomplished on that cross, Lord God. But we pray, Lord God, that we'd respond in a way that brings you honor, grace, and glory and praise. Lord God, that's that you would reveal to us the life that you saved us from, the debt that you paid, the bill that you settled. I pray that the many would come to know you through this message. I pray that many would come to know you more. And I pray that even as we respond now in this ministry time, come and move, come and minister to your people. Come Holy Spirit. Your blood still works, Lord God. It still works. You're our faithful God. You still work, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.